Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by legendary trainer, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how are you? Good, Ken. Good to see you in your, as we've said before, one of your many locations, one of your many domains. Um, I'm not sure which one you are. I don't know what hemisphere you're in. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I mean, it could be... <laughs> I mean, it could be your one of your places in uh, where is that in uh, the north of France? Uh, <laughs> it could be Tibet. It it could be as close as uh, somewhere in uh, Colorado, where you're maybe getting a little less skiing in. I'm not sure, but it's always <laughs> just beautiful to see you. It's great to see you. Before we get into it today, I just want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, BJJ Fanatics. They're a website. They they do um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu tutorials, starting to branch out into boxing, and they recently partnered up with none other than the great Teddy Atlas. So, Teddy, I'll turn it over to you. Tell me a little bit about BJJ Fanatics and what you did for them. They're a good company. They're, they're good guys. I, I try to feel as though I'm not going to do something with anybody if I don't feel they're, I don't know. You want to feel they're legitimate, they're good people. And I was blessed enough where they came to me to do an instructional video on boxing. And I'm going to be the first boxing guy that they do. They've, they're they the best in the world. Like I feel funny saying it because I'm, you know, I'm doing it with them. So, oh yeah, Teddy, of course. You know, what are you going to say? Just, <laughs> what are you going to say? They're the second best? Uh, they're the best in the world. They're the biggest in the world at doing combat sports uh, instructional videos, and mm -hmm. they've worked with they've worked with guys like the guy who trained. Uh, I believe his name is John Danaher, a famous trainer, UFC trainer who trained a legendary guy George Saint Pierre. Uh, I even know that name because when we were doing Friday night fights up in Montreal. Uh, he was he was still on top as a UFC fighter, and he he had done a show just before we were up there, and he brought in something like I don't want to be inaccurate, but it was like crazy, forty thousand people, well whatever yeah. it was, it was it was a it was a crazy number, and he at that time I hadn't heard of him. I was like, who the frick is this guy? You know, <laughs> and people told me quickly. They said, Teddy, I know you're not, and we've gotten more into it now, you know, with the UFC and with the MMA, but, and we've been talking about those guys and breaking down their fights and stuff, and I have a lot of respect. You have a lot of respect for them. Uh, but, like they said to me real quick, this guy's a legend. This guy's one of the greatest, even my son, dad. George St. Pierre is one of the greatest UFC, MMA fighters, whatever you call them, of all time. One of the greatest. So these guys with BJJ Fanatics, they take the guys to teach them, the trainers, and they do these instructional videos. And they do a great job with them. And then they came to me and... This will be the first. They've done striking. They do grappling. They do jujitsu. The two of them are two guys in their own right that are tremendously accomplished in their sport. Forget about being producers and directors and what they're doing now with having the biggest uh, company in the world for doing this stuff, instructional videos. They were big in the business, both of them. Uh, matter of fact, one of them is a legendary jiu-jitsu guy. Uh, well, one of the, you know, guys that won everything and was great. And his partner, a guy who, of course, was a top competitor in in these different... Uh, Disciplines? Well, yeah, whether it's striking or whether it's grappling. I believe his forte was grappling, but the different disciplines. And I'm lucky enough that they came to me and say, hey, yeah, we'd like to do, you know, a boxing one with you. And the last thing I say is that one of them, there's two partners, good guys. One of them is married, 
You talk about royalty. One of them is married to the Gracies, to one of the Gracies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that that's where it all began. Yep. I mean, that's where it all started. I mean, this MMA stuff, this UR, there's always a genesis. There's always a start, right? There's always a spark, a beginning, you know? Yep. Where did where did Earth come from? The Big Bang? I'm not sure. Uh, the Big Bang or the whatever. There's all kinds of different theories of where it started. Well, it all started with the Gracies, and they're legendary. Matter of fact, so much. Tell me, you know more about it than me, Ken. But tell me that so much so that it wasn't even called jiu-jitsu. It was called Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yep. Because they dominated it. Yep. And they have their own schools. And if you come from a Gracie school, well, you know what? It's kind of like, well, you better be ready tonight. You know, you, you, better, be, you better be ready tonight. Because they were, they were the top of the top. And of all the Gracies I've ever met, and I know a few of them from New York and L.A., they're the nicest people in the world, incredibly humble. Well, that's how the legitimate ones, the real... That's how the real top people in anything usually are. Yeah, there's no pretense. There's there's no necessary. Uh, they don't feel it's necessary to how for their meals. They know what they are. Yeah, they don't have point. to go out there and put their chest out. They don't have to act ignorant or silly or stupid or you know uh, anything uh, to get attention. They know what they are. And it's a quiet confidence. It's nice to know who you are. It's not a bad thing. It's nice. And it's gracious. And these guys are gracious. And um, like I said, the, the, the Gracies, I remember the Gracies. And I'm not an MMA guy. And I'm, we're becoming people are saying, hey, Teddy, you're really into the MMA. You're really into the UFC. <laughs> I know fighting. I know yeah. fighting. And I appreciate fighting. Yeah. I can recognize the parallels. And what it takes to be really good, I think. And I remember the Gracies. I remember what, years ago watching one of the first, I think it was UFC, but whatever. Uh, I don't know if it was that, you know, brand yet, but watching MMA. And I see this skinny guy. Probably you know? Royce Gracie. Yeah. I see this skinny guy and I'm saying, well, what's this guy going to do? You know, that's my ignorance. Boxing, I would never say that. See, that was me learning on the job. <laughs> because boxing, I'd never say that. Because boxing yeah. would be like, hey, you better look out. This guy's skinny. He can punch. He gets talk. He gets leverage. You know, Bob Fawcett, Alexis Oguayo, Carlos Zarate, you know, Tommy Hearns. You name them. Skinny guys. Lou Jenkins. You want to go back even farther? Guys that look like they need a meal. Hey, pal, you need a meal? <laughs> yeah, you look uh, You look malnutrition. Malnutrition. But they could punch like a, you know, yeah. blankety blank. And <laughs> so I see this skinny guy. I'm like, what the? And then I see him on the ground. And there's, you know, big guy, burly guy banging on him. I'm saying, what the? Uh, you know, crazy, huh? Uh, you know, he won't be seeing him no more. And then <laughs> all of a sudden, it's one of the most phenomenal things I've ever seen as far as going to the limits, as far as what I describe on ESPN and on our show for my, my whole career as a commentator, where I try to describe the ability of somebody where they separate themselves physically from other people because they have the capacity to go to a place, to a hidden, cavernous, dark place and never let it get dark. Never let the lights go out. Uh, and that was Gracie. He was the perfect, oh my God. He was, he was like, it was like putting a picture of something in Webster's Dictionary. You know, I said, and then this is what it is. This yep. is what Teddy's been talking about. This is what I'm talking about. This is about going beyond yourself, finding a way, just refusal to even think of the suggestion of submission. Refusal, yeah. completely, like, like, like you might crack a guy for, for saying the first half of the word. 
Yeah. You might crack them with a kick. What? <laughs> <laughs> just, just, that is not allowed in my domain, in my realm. Yeah. Not allowed. And, but people could talk about it. Like you could see guys on TV, you know, they, they give that image in the movies. You know, whether it was Van Damme or Chuck Norris, all great, you know, mixed martial arts guys you watch. You know, all those, you know, all those guys. Or what, what was the other one? The one with the ponytail. Um, Seagal. Seagal. You know, all those guys, they talk about it and all that stuff. But doing it, <laughs> doing it. You remember before they had the UFC, it, there was always the debate. I remember as when I was a kid, there was no UFC, but people would be like, oh, this guy's a kung fu master, and this one's a karate, and this one will beat that one. And then the UFC came along and said, no, nope, bring all your skills. Bring your kung fu guy, your karate guy, boxer, wrestler, and the jiu-jitsu guy beats everyone. Every time, no weight limits, no weight classes. You fight three or four times in a night, and Hoist Gracie is just beating everybody. Skinny little guy. You know, like like before you get started, you want to say, can, can I give you a donut? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I mean? Just to sustain, to make it sustainable. Can I give you a donut? And But here, 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 here. This is Mount Everest, baby. The top of the top. For real. No Steven Seagal. For real. No cut, cut. You okay? You got a little, uh, you all right? You, you sure? Well, especially in you those wanna, early days. You want to you wanna wipe that, that little blood? Uh, you okay? You sure you okay? Can you continue? But I'm watching this this fight, right? And here's this guy named Gracie. And he got this big guy pounding on him. He's, got, he's on the floor. Little did I know, Gracie wanted to be on the floor. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like the beetle yeah. letting the spider in. Oh, come on in, Mr. Spider. Oh, I'm going to come in, you idiot. I'm going to eat you. Well, come on in. Come in, Mr. Spider. Come on in. And next thing you know, the 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 beetle's picking his teeth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't know that was coming. I didn't know that Gracie was going to, you know, be picking his teeth in a couple minutes. And he's on the floor. And Ken, I'm telling you, uh, he... The other guy gets him in a submission lock, you know, a headlock of, of yeah. whatever whatever the proper terms are. I don't know. But he gets yeah. him, you know, the great Joe Rogan and all these guys who are really great with the MMA, with the UFC stuff, they would know exactly what the proper, you know, the proper call of the technique would be. But all I know is the guy's in, he's in a problem. He's up. You know what, creek. <laughs> That's yeah. all I know. And yeah. he can't breathe. And he's got him in his... Sl and they're talking about he's going to have to submit. Well, I guess they didn't They didn't know quite enough about Gracie yet. Quite enough. The, that, that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And he's got him in this hold where, like, you're supposed to submit. I mean, for the most part. You yeah. know. It's almost a... Like it's like when you watch a movie and the guy dies and you're watching him on the table and his spirit goes out of him and it's above him. And so people are watching and they're looking and they just see the body and they're like, oh, oh. And they don't realize that the spirit has left already. So there's nothing you can do to the body anymore. The, the body is, you know, nothing you can do to it anymore. But the spirit is still there. And it's like the spirit has left the body for a moment and it's watching the body. And so you could choke it. You could hit it with a sledgehammer. <laughs> you, you could get a jackhammer. You get a chisel. <laughs> you know, whatever you want to do, there ain't nothing happen because when you want to look and the spirit snuck out <laughs> and he's hovering over and he's watching the body and he's, he's like, go ahead. You have no impact on me. You have no impact on me. I'm out here, and I'm 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 not allowing the body to react the way you want it to react because I'm here, and I'm the only one who can do anything. And really, I, and all of a sudden, 
he's supposed to be gone. And he goes way beyond the time. It's like watching somebody hold their breath underwater, which it's not supposed to be possible. Like you're standing there and saying, well, that's five minutes. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's got to be dead. Yeah. I mean, it's not possible. But people do it. How do they do it, Ken? How do they do it? How do they go to that place that other people don't go? By being willing to go to that place and find out that they could go to that place. So here he is. I'm watching it. And I'm like, oh, what the freak? Is the guy dead? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the guy's in close on him with the headlock. He doesn't submit, of course. And the next thing you know, the legs of Gracie go up around the guy's neck like a python in, in a jungle movie. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, a, and a snake goes up around, the legs go up around the guy's neck. And within 10 seconds, the guy, he's out. It's over. <laughs> it's over. Yeah. And I'm saying, holy crap. That's Gracie. <laughs> That's all I remember. That's crazy. Wow. Wow. That's UFC. That's MMA. That's jujitsu. That, I don't know what the frick it is. <laughs> I don't know what it is. All I know is that is special. That is a champion. Like the story I told on one of our episodes when Customato, who never watched nothing but boxing, comes in and I'm having my few minutes to be left alone and I'm watching the Olympics and I think it was, I don't know if it was Nadia Kamenich or Olga Corbin. I, I get confused. It was Kamenich. And, and I'm watching, I'm watching it in the Olympics. Big, big thing back then, you know, uh, the gymnastics, huge. And I'm watching her on the bus. She's like, 12 years old. Maybe she was 14. I don't know. But she looked like she was about 10. And she's on the bar, and I'm watching it, and I'm l looking. What the? I don't know anything about gymnastics, but I'm watching something special. And Cuz comes walking in. Knows nothing about nothing but boxing. When he used to come in and see me watching a football game, he said, what's that? I said, Cuz, come on. Leave me alone. Stop. <laughs> come on. Stop. You know what this is. It's football. What is it? Come on. Come on, what is it? What, what's that? Why does the ball look like that? <laughs> Why do you look like an egg? What, what is that? <laughs> I mean, Cuss, it's football. Please, stop. All right, what are you watching that for? So he comes walking in the room, and I'm watching the Olympics, and I'm watching Kamenich up on the... Nobody even knew who she was at that time. This is her debut, you know, the Olympics. And she's on a bar, and her legs are like over here, and her head is here, and her... She's looking between her legs, and her, uh, she's like this, and she's looking back between her legs, and her legs are, uh, she's like a contortionist, and she's in this, it was like, what the, and she ain't moving. She's frozen in time, and like everything around her is frozen, and she ain't moving, and she's got the strength, the focus, the everything in place to hold herself without even moving. Cuss walks in, he looks, he takes one look. One look, one second, goes like this. Champion walks out. <laughs> she winds up getting all tens. First time in the history, first time in the history of Olympics, gymnastics, all tens. Ten, 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 ten. I'm like, I look for Cuss, he's gone. Like, what the f Who was that man? <laughs> Who was that man? Who was that man? He just, come, <laughs> he just comes in, champion, walks out. Never watched any gymnastics in his life. That's what Gracie was, champion. Anyway, I I digress. <laughs> I've been known to do that. And and that's who I'm with. I'm with those guys. We're doing it. And in a week or two, uh, we filmed, we already filmed the instructional video. We filmed it in the, one of the gyms here in Staten Island. And we filmed about four hours. They're going to obviously do their stuff and edit it down and do what they do and get it out there and in a week or two whatever i don't know when this episode's going to be shown but by the time this is shown somewhere around that time it'll probably be out on their website and that's it bjjfanatics.com well speaking of the best of the best i want to talk to you today about the top five uh top five best knockouts of all time 
And I know you're a bit of a boxing historian, as most of the fans know, so I wanted to get your take. I came prepared. I'm not surprised. I came ready. You never come unprepared. I try not to. I mean, Cus used to tell me part of being a professional is preparation. It's not too complicated. Yep. It's not, it's not too complicated, you know? Um, the main part was always separating your emotions from the work that has to be done. Don't let the emotions get in the way. Do not allow them to conspire against you or to compromise you. Um, that's a pro. That's a pro. Anyway, number one. Five best knockouts of all time. Greatest knockouts of all time. Can we get a drum roll? <laughs> Can we get a drum roll? Number one, Sugar Ray Robinson, the original Sugar Ray Robinson versus Gene Fulmer in the rematch. Here's one of the things you got to know. Sugar Ray Robinson might be the greatest fighter of all time. A lot of people feel he is. I got Henry Armstrong. I got Sam Langford. Google him. Go ahead. I got a few guys. I got Sugar Ray Robinson in there too because of his talents, his abilities, his consistency, 200 fights. We're never going to have an era like that again, ever, ever. And because uh, the best fought the best and you had a lot of the best because you had a lot of clubs around the country where fighters could become fighters, where they could hone their skills, where they could develop, where they could... You have a great surgeon, guess what? The surgeon has to have a place to do surgery to become greater. The fighters had a place to do fights to become greater. They they fought... Nowadays, what do you fight? You have a long career if you had 30 fights, 40 fights, very long. Um, well, back in those days, you had 30 fights in a year. In a year. <laughs> there was a lot of clubs, a lot of places to fight. And when you had a lot of places to fight, you could get better. You could get better. And Gene Fulmer was a tremendous middleweight champion. Strong, like country strong, Ken. They would call him country strong. You know, picking up bales of hay. <laughs> Came from Utah. And uh, now you're going to get Utahians, Utahians or whatever they call them. They'll be calling in saying, oh, I didn't pick up bells. Hey, Teddy, why are you lumping us into a group? I'm from Utah, and we don't pick up bells. Hey, all right, okay, you didn't pick up one. Maybe you should because it's it's, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's a good workout. It's, it's not going to hurt you. But okay, okay, you're not one of them. But country strong, not just lifting weights. Country strong, real strength, great shin. One thing about Sugar Ray Robinson, you know what you didn't want to be around back in those days with Sugar Ray Robinson, Ken? What's that? An opponent? You didn't want to be the guy who beat him and is fighting him in the rematch. <laughs> 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 That's one of the reasons he was great. Because if you were lucky enough, and very few people beat him, but if you were fortunate enough, good enough, whatever, to beat him, well, in the rematch... You usually got knocked out because he, <laughs> he fixed what went wrong. Yeah. One of the signs of a great one. You beat you beat Michael Jordan. Everybody's been watching him documentary, Last Dance. You beat Michael Jordan once. You didn't want to face him the second time. Yeah. Because he came ready, more than ready, because that's one of the things that kept him up at night. And it's what it made him one of the things that made him great. So it's the rematch. Former had beaten him. And here's Sugar Ray Robinson, who was really a welterweight. You know, he went up to middleweight, even went up to light heavyweight, uh, to fight Joey Archer. Uh and yeah, I mean, you know, but a lot of people say my, probably the greatest welterweight maybe of all time. And he's fighting, he's a middle he had he's fighting Former. In the rematch, Robinson had been middleweight champ, and uh, he's fighting Fulmer. And Fulmer, this strong, 
bow guy who was underrated as a fighter too, but just really strong. He's coming at him. And Robinson, never seen before in the ring. I never seen him before. Just an, the great ones just make it up as they do it sometimes. They just make it up. Henry Armstrong on the horn. I never heard that note before. Mm-hmm. It's the great Henry Armstrong. He just made it. He 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 did it. You know, Jimi Hendrix on the guitar, playing it upside down, <laughs> upside down, upside down. <laughs> <laughs> and makes his own music. Sugar Ray Robinson, Foreman's coming at him. Robinson steps to his right. Pop. Steps to his right. Pop. And at the same time, never never seen this before, really. I'm sure fighters have done it. But as he steps to his right, boom, he times a left hook. Short. Like, short. And um, Google it, baby. Well, no, Rob's going to take care of it. But, uh just, just, what can I say? Magnificent. Knocks out Former. The really, Former's tremendous chin, everything. Never sees a punch coming. Uh, unbelievable. Because everything goes into it. It's not just the power, not just the result. What, what does Teddy Atlas put into picking his greatest knockouts of all time? The guy who's getting knocked out, the level of competition. All right. I think it's got to be part of it. Uh, it's got to be significant. Uh the way he does it, the technique he uses, how he gets it across, the power, the result, how dynamic, how explosive, maybe how legendary sometimes. Uh, you know, and sometimes it'll have to do with the moment too. You know, was he behind? Was he, did he have to find a way? And he found a way. One, one of the ones I'm going to just jump off the, the path for a second that's not on my list, but I'm just thinking of it, was the great Rocky Marciano. He's losing a fight going into the 13th round, 15 round fights for the world title against Jersey Joe Walcott, a great, great, great fighter. Champion is Walcott. Marciano's fighting him. And it's the 13th round. Marciano can't win except by knockout. So you can't just keep swinging from the fence. You ain't going to land. You have to have a trick. And part of his genius, part of his greatness, Marciano, only undefeated heavyweight in the history, you know, after heavyweight division, 49 and 0, he retired. He's fighting a great jersey, Joe. He starts the left hand. Just, just to get his eyes to go there. Bop! Hits him the right hand. It's in the bars. If you see that picture in the bars, Jersey Joe getting hit with the right hand, that's it. It's in a lot of the, you know, the saloons. And what made that a great knockout, and that shows you how great these are, it's not even on my list, is what made it with the competition, it's tough competition, Ken. What made it so great was he was behind, he was desperate, and yet he didn't act desperate. He didn't behave desperate. He behaved smart, controlled, like a guy who was about to become champion. And he found a way. He found the right delivery system. He was able to take that power and land it in a perfect way. It's one thing to have power. It's another thing to be able to land it and against a good fighter. So anyway, that's number one. Number two. Did I just mention Jersey Joe Walcott? Yeah. Number two, the great Jersey Joe Walcott versus the great Ezra Charles, the Cincinnati Cobra. Two greatest fighters of all time. Two of the greatest fighters of all time. Fans of the show, by the way, sorry to interrupt. Fans of the show will appreciate the comparison you made between this knockout and the, and the uh, flying knee knockout thrown by Jorge Masvidal in the UFC against uh, Ben Askren. We had Jorge on the show. If you want to go back and watch that one, there's a great analysis. Teddy did a great analysis of that punch versus the knee that Jorge Masvidal threw to knock out Ben Askren, who was undefeated coming into that fight. Yeah, Masvidal is a special guy, and the reason he's special 
not just because he threw a knee, a hard knee, and could knock out anyone if you landed, but he was smart enough. He had the, the instinct, the innate ability to understand and the intellect under pressure to set it up to get it in. Yeah. Like, who's going to let you hit him with a knee? I'm not. <laughs> you're not, right? Yeah. I, no, I'm serious. I mean, like, like who's? Uh, I don't want to get hit with a knee. So you got to set yeah. the guy up. <clears throat> and and Mazadov showed his genius by doing that. I think he's a little bit of Bruce Lee. He's he's he walks to his own drummer. Yep. And uh he does it his way. You know, like Sinatra was saying, my way. Uh you know, he so Jersey Joe Walcott, he's fighting the great as a Charles. You're not just gonna land a punch against a great fighter. That's the that's the key. But Jersey Joe was an innovator. He was a pioneer. <laughs> The great Ali took a lot of stuff from him. Took little stuff. Hey, you you steal, you grab little things from from great ones, and then you put your own touch on it. That's how it works sometimes. And and Ali, I think, stole a little bit from Jersey Joe, but he made it. Made it. He changed it, but he took the idea. Jersey Joe Walcott used to set you up different ways. Great puncher, by the way. He used to adjust his trunks. They used to walk away, turn around, walk a few steps, and then if you follow him, he turned around, and bang, he caught you. Or he, he walked this way, and then bang. Uh, you know, so he's fighting the great as of Charles. He knows you're not just going to throw a naked punch, a cold punch, you know, and land. It's not happening. It's not happening. It's, you know, it's kind of like going down the lane uh, against Matambo. Remember Matambo? The, the, yeah. the the great center. Tecumbe Decum, Matumbo. Tecumbe Matumbo. Remember this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yep. love it. I love it. Yep. Ken, how do you not love this? Look. The finger wag. No, 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 yep. no, no. You yep. know come in. You, he had that heavy African accent. You know come here. There's snow. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh, big mistake. <laughs> As he swatted your ball like 400 feet away. You know what I mean? Yep. Great defensive player. You come down the lane. You're trying to get in there, and he blocks you, right? He swats you. And so you can't just go in there and throw a layup up and think it's going in. You got to be more creative than that against Matambo. Matambo. Well, it's the same thing here. You're not just going to go throw a punch. It's going to land against the great as a Charles. It's not happening. You got to trick him. You got to set him up. So he adjusts his trunks. He's got a little separation. He's probably about... I don't know, seven feet away, maybe eight, separates. He starts shucking his shoulders, moving side to side as he's walking to him. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's like the hypnotist with the watch. He's, <laughs> he's hypnotizing you. He's making you look at that instead of what you should be looking at. Yeah. The freaking punch. So he's... And then he times one of them, and that's a perfect time. Wow! Bang! Oh, my God. I mean, all for the motion, natural. And he catches the great Ezra Charles cold with a left uppercut oh, that, that could send you to Mount Rushmore, you know? <laughs> and, and, I mean... Just your head, by the way, not because that's all they put on Mount Rushmore is heads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't put the whole body. You know what I mean? So just the head. Just, that's bad. I mean, send the body. No, we just want the head. We just accept heads. That's all. <laughs> so, I mean, Ken, you got You guys are going to see it, but you have to appreciate not just the power, but the delivery of it, the setup of it. That's what you have. It's like it's like appreciating when somebody asks their future wife to marry them, how they do it, how they how they get the engagement ring that special night to them. They they put it in they they put in the dessert. Hopefully yep. it, it doesn't get eaten. That's happened too. <laughs> that's that's happened too. Uh, you know. So I mean, it's kind of it's about it's about the way you. The creativity, the magic, the way that you set it up to give the engagement ring, to to make that moment, that moment, and what he yeah. did to make this moment that moment was the setup. So that's number two. Number three, 
Drum roll. Okay, I hear a dog barking, but that's good <laughs> enough. That's good enough. Mike Weaver versus Big John Tate back in the days when it was still 15 rounds heavyweight championship of the world. The undefeated heavyweight champ John Tate from Tennessee, Olympian, Olympic bronze medalist on a famous, I think the greatest Olympic team of all time, 1976. Five, five gold medals from that team. Five. And they all became heavyweight champs. And he was on a team and he won a bronze and he became a, not heavyweight champ, I'm sorry, they all became world, world champions. champions. But he was on a team, he didn't win a gold, he won a bronze and he became a world champion, heavyweight champion of the world. But, you had Sugar Ray Leonard, you had Howard Davis Jr., you had the Sphinx brother, Leon and Michael, and you had Leo Randolph. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And they fought great fighters, Cuban, great Cuban team. They, they, unbelievable. Matter of fact, Tate lost to the great Cuban, Tefilio Stevenson. In those Olympics, he was one of the only of, he's one of three men in the history of Olympic Boxing that won three gold medals in three different Olympics. So he, he fought the best of the best. He was, uh, but hey, Sugar Ray Leonard fought the best of the best to win his gold medal in a gold medal match against the Cuban. I think his name was Herrera. But here's Big John Tate fighting Mike Weaver. Mike Weaver didn't have a great record. Rob will get it up for you. Let me know, Rob, if you see it. But it wasn't a great record. Uh, you know, it had some losses, but he could punch. They didn't know who he was, really. But he could punch. And he had a body that looked like uh, Hercules. 41-18-1. See, there it is. 41-18-1. His final record. So so he had a bunch of losses. You don't think that he's going to beat an undefeated, whatever. But he had the seasoning, the experience, the hunger. He grabbed the moment. He had the power. And what a moment, Ken. You talk about Rocky. At the time of that fight, Weaver was 21-9. and nine. 21 and 9. There you are, baby. 21 and 9. Second fight after he won the after after um Tate won the title against um Jerry Cor Concia. Jerry Concia. Concia, yeah. Sorry, and then he fights know. Mike Weaver in the next fight in uh Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah, so here it is. Here it is. So Mike Weaver looks like Hercules. He's got nine losses. And you talk about a real life, real life. I'll say it again. Real life. Rocky moment. This is Rocky. This is Rocky. This is Rocky. Forget about, you know, Stallone and, uh, you know, all that stuff. I mean, I get it. I mean, Stallone's great and the Rocky movies were great. You know, all 110 of them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the first one, unbelievable. The first two, uh, some people say beyond that. Uh, but you talk about a, what's it supposed to represent? The underdog, that would be Weaver, nine losses, that's supposed to have no shot, pulling it out of the fire. When it's supposed to be, it's gone, it's done. The lights have been turned out. Like the great Dandy Don Meredith of the original Monday Night Football team with Howard Cosell, you know, uh, and... Uh, who was the other partner, the uh, the great football player? Uh, Don Meredith? Play, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Don Meredith, he was the quarterback, uh, former quarterback for Dallas Cowboys. And uh, and then you had the guy that was the running back. Frank Gifford. Frank Gifford, great player. And th they were the original Monday Night Football guys. And at the end, when it was over, uh, Dandy Don, you know, he's a bit of a character, he was the guy that was the you know fooling around saying a few jokes too, and uh, he would say good night Irene, good night Irene. The party's over, <laughs> the party's over. Well, the party was over. I mean, this again, as great as the Rocky movie, this was real Rocky before Rocky. I mean, this was this was a real Rocky movie, and fifteenth round. Way behind on all the scorecards. Can't win. Can't win. Can't win. Seconds left. 
Rob will find out how much time. But whatever. In my mind, it was seconds. But last round, way behind on the scorecards. Way behind on the score. Can't win. In, in Knoxville, I believe. John Tate's hometown. And Mike Weaver, somebody forgot to tell me he couldn't win. And somebody forgot to make sure on the pads, on the heavy bag. And he had Ace Miller as a trainer manager, and he was great. He had a lot of great fighters. Johnny Bumpus, Bernard Taylor. He had some of the greatest stable back then, great amateurs. And uh, they, they all, I think they all became world champions, all, most of them. And so Ace Miller was great. But they somebody didn't remind and spend enough time with Tate maybe on a heavy bag or pads keeping the right hand up when you throw the left hook and remember you don't hook with a hooker how much time was left Rob? it was 2 minutes 15 seconds of the 15th round ok 45, 45 seconds. seconds 45 seconds left Ken in the 15th round we'll never have that again because there's no more 15 round fights he was behind on all three scorecards. Oh, sorry, there were two scorecards, and the ref was the scoring as well. The ref had it 38-33 in favor of Tate. The other two had 37-34 and 36-33 all for Tate. Can't he's good, you know he's got it. Yeah, and he hooks with a hooker, and Mike Weaver, Rocky, the real Rocky, real life Rocky. Hits him a left hook, and Tate falls face first, straight down. You call it poleaxed, whatever. I mean, face first, face first, boom, straight down, out, as cold as a cucumber. Uh, I mean, uh, like it was like I hate to, you don't want to disparage. We're not trying to disparage, but we're being graphic, and uh, of how. Just the moment, how powerful it was, how, how, just how crazy it was. Um, it was like a fisherman taking a mackerel, a big mackerel, after he already pulled it out of the water and just throw it on the deck of the, the boat. Like, you're out as cold as a mackerel. Did I just make that up? I think that's been said before. <laughs> and, I mean, just face first, Ken, out. What a knockout. Wow. Wow. Um, number four. Somebody I knew who I was friends with who cost, was my mentor, Customato, obviously, along with Mike Tyson, moved this man into the heavyweight world championship. Uh, I knew him up in New Paltz when I lived for seven years up in Catskill. He was 45 minutes away in New Paltz and we used to fight against his amateur. I used to take my amateur team and fight his amateur team. And Tracy Patterson, his adopted son, who became a world champion. I had kids like Greg, Greg Young fight him and a whole bunch of times. Uh, Floyd Patterson versus Igamar Johansson, the rematch, number two. Igamar Johansson, he had the thunderbolt, the lightning bolt in his right hand uh, from Sweden. He would set you up. He would, he would, you know, he would paint the, he would paint with the left like this, kind of like George Foreman did later. Uh, Tefilio Stevenson did the great Tefilio Stevenson, the great amateur, three-time gold medalist, three different Olympics from Cuba. Uh, the same way that Deontay Wilder, the great puncher, former heavyweight champ, uh, did uh, a couple times. Uh, he had that. Again, uh, you blind, he would just, Igamar would just make you feel comfortable and hypnotize you with the left and boom, the right hand was there. You never saw it coming and that was, you know, he knocked you out. And that's how he knocked Patterson out in the first fight. In the rematch, Floyd Patterson, you talk about signature punches. Well, Igamar had the signature right hand off the jab. Floyd had the signature leaping left hook. And, uh, he put it into play, and he he catches Igamar on his shin with a leaping left hook. And Patterson was a small heavyweight. They all were back in those days for the most part, you know, 180 pounds, whatever, and 182 or something, came up from middleweight. 
And Patterson had fast hands, great power. Patterson lands this left hook, knocks him cold. So cold, we're going to show it on the film, that his leg is quivering. He's laying there, Ken. He's laying out cold, flat, out. And one of his legs, I don't know if it was his left or his right, it's doing this. That's not good, by the way. No. It's twitching. It's quivering. So much so that Patterson immediately runs over, bends down. He was a compassionate guy, Patterson. He really was. He bends down, immediately runs over instead of celebrating and bends down because he thought he killed him. He said that afterwards. They said, why'd you run yeah. over to him? And, you know, he said, I thought I, I thought I killed him. He was the first one to attend to him, even before the referee. The ref bends down, but Patterson runs over and gets in there before him. It was the second time he knocked him down in the round with that punch. Unbelievable. And and Ken, he was the first, the significance too, the history. He was the, he became the first heavyweight ever to regain the heavyweight title at that time. Oh, wow. Think about that with the long history of the sport. Yeah. He became the first heavyweight to regain his title that night. Uh, wow. Vicious knockout. Number five. You guys out there that say I don't give this man his due enough. Well, bite your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> you know I love you all, but bite your tongue. Bite your tongue. Number five of the greatest knockouts in the history of this marvelous sport. Mike Tyson winning the heavyweight title. A youngest heavyweight champ in the history of the sport. Breaking Floyd Patterson's record. Knocking out Trevor Burbick. Trevor Burbick, uh, I think it was from Jamaica. Solid fighter. Solid fighter. Good solid fighter. Good chin. You know. Good enough puncher. Knows how to to get through things. How to go rounds. Obviously how to win fights. To be in that position obviously right. As a champion. He. Tyson had been taught as a kid. With me and Cuss. And Cuss, really, Cuss was the one who laid this out. I'm the one in the gym the first three years, whatever, uh, teaching him and, you know, doing the work with him to develop the habits. But Cuss was the one that would always say, he basically broke down the anatomy of, of a fighter and where you wanted to, where the most vulnerable areas were on a body to hit to destroy somebody. <laughs> and that's safe. <nice. laughs> that's what do you want me to do? Uh, you think we're making cupcakes over here? You know what I mean? <laughs> so it gets a little sounds a little rough. All right, it's a rough sport. So Cus would say, All right, let's show you the body, and the weak spots. No different than a karate master, the pressure points, you know. Uh, and Cus is a genius. He, he, wants, he wants to have an edge. Okay, here they are. You got the liver. You got the liver. Uh, left hook to the liver. On the right side of the guy's body, just below his elbow. You hit him there, and the, the cap just destroys a guy. Uh, his mind's okay, but his... His body's not, you know. Yeah, his legs are like, hey, you do what you want to do. I ain't. I'm staying right here. <laughs> 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 you want to go back in? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll be over here, by the way. I'll be over here watching. I'll be here watching. <laughs> and uh, you know, for normal people, but some people overcome it. Some people are special because they make themselves special. That's the greatness of this sport. You get a chance to make yourself special. So here, you, here you got the liver, you got behind the ear, you hit the guy here, Teddy, make sure you tell him, and he's telling Tyson too, because hit him behind the ear, you, you, 
You hit the uh, fallopian tube, to whatever, I don't know, I, I, not that, whatever the name of it, some <laughs> kind of tube. Uh, fallopian might be the one that uh, women have kids through. I don't know. I, yeah. I might be a little misdirected there. <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> uh, you're thinking of the auditory tubes or the eustachian tube. There it is. There it is. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. So you hit him behind the ear and you throw the equilibrium off. So even if he gets up, he can't stay up. Yeah. Because it's a physical fact. Your equilibrium is going to be uh, screwed up. And then there's the right hand under the heart. I mean, are you ready to watch a rerun of Hannibal Lecter? Uh, <laughs> the Hannibal, the cannibal, Hannibal, the cannibal. I mean, it sounds like we're doing a rerun of Hannibal. We're doing a prelude into Hannibal Lecter uh, yeah. movie, right? But uh, this is what it was, okay? Then, of course, there's the floating rib. Mm, um, um, <laughs> With a little Chianti, <laughs> I, I love. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna saute your liver. With a little, <laughs> and have a little Chianti with it. Remember the when he yeah yeah yeah, uh, Silence of the Lambs. So, and then you had the temple, the temple. So, Tyson has taught all these things by the great cause, and uh, he's on the inside with Burbick, who's an inside fighter, and he's on the inside with Burbick. And the only opening was the temple. So he hits him a short left hook. We always talked about short punches like Joe, Joe, the great Joe Lewis. And he hits him a short left hook. You know, it doesn't even look. The, the, uh, one of the signs of a great punch is it doesn't, even look, uh, it doesn't even look like anything. Like the great Joe DiMaggio. All the great Yankee fans used to tell me that the greatness about Joe DiMaggio out in the outfield, the Yankee Clipper, was it didn't even look like it was like trying like it was so effortless effortless it was so so easy just so natural like you know and some of the great ones uh, that this punch with Tyson that night again like I talked about in another episode where Tyson was so special the night that he fought Spinks this particular night he was he was around the same thing he was, he knew, it's like he knew his, he knew what was going to happen. Like he knew his destiny. It was like, he was just, like it had happened already. And he was just going in there to make it official. Like, like it already played out. Like he already did the fight. And now it was just a matter of going in there and go through. But it's already been done. It's already been done. It's like, Drawing a picture, and now you just have to color it in. So anyway, he's on the inside with Burbick Tyson, and just boom, don't even look like nothing. Joe DiMaggio in the outfield. And oh, what happens after that? I mean, the mountain comes it down. Was, and it avalanche. was like a delayed reaction, too. It was like took a second or two for Burbick to go down and once he did the poor guy his body was separated from his head the delayed reaction you said it I'm so glad you yeah. said that delayed it's like it's like he got hit and it's like the guy you ever see that commercial where the guy opened his, it's calling all the different parts you, you ever see that yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, going, yeah. hello legs okay here coming down legs we're coming down here uh, getting ready to go down arm you're getting ready to collapse, arm. Uh, shoulder, you're getting ready to cave. Okay. Uh, you know, and it, it was like that. It was like the, the, the central system, the, the guy up in the he head tower there. Uh, the in command the center. In the command center, the control center. It's like, okay, I think we have to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> we you can see what. When Burbick went down, you could tell his brain was saying, oh, man, I go, I'm go, i down. Like, get up quick. And he jumps back up, and his mind is telling him he's good, but his legs are, like, on crazy street. He's wobbling left. He goes down once, twice, three times through the ropes. 
even when Mills Lane steps in, he's still like, let me at him. And they're like, no, 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 you're not. <laughs> Your legs left a long time ago. Like the guy coming out of the bar, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're just describing it the right way. We're not, again, yeah. it's not disparaging. It's it's real stuff. And uh, the guy out in the bar, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. Do you understand you've been out for 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> you're not fine. Well, I, I'm yeah. good. I'm fine. You're not fine. You've been laying on the freaking floor for the last half hour. You're not yeah. fine. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? I, I'm I just actually telling. felt bad. I feel bad for Burbick watching that because he was a good champion, but man, that was, he looked, it was that was embarrassing way to get knocked. Oh, out. it was it was oh, but it was a hell of a way for a star to be born, wasn't it? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, if you're gonna be a star on Broadway, you want to come out and make that Broadway night, make that moment, pull that curtain back, and make them make a statement, make a oh, yeah. moment, right? You wanna you want. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just saying, you want you want the audience to be like they're not gonna leave. They're like they they make you open the curtain again. Even before he landed that shot, though, the, he missed him with a right uppercut. That if he hit him, he probably would have been far worse than wobbling around. He would have been out cold. Yeah, he, a winging right uppercut before he hit him with that short left. But again, it fits in. I'm gonna say it. That would have put him out of his out of his misery in some ways. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, oh yeah, fl flopping all over the place. I mean, yep. you know, like you know. Somebody put this guy out. Of his I mean, it was like one of those movies. Like <laughs> yeah. somebody, you know, like and, a horse with a broken leg. Like somebody yeah. put that horse down, <laughs> and the horse <laughs> is still trying to run, but doesn't realize he doesn't. The leg isn't behaving. Yeah, I thought I went to rough places, but Ken is. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, you might have topped me on that one, um, <laughs> which is good. It was really was. Uh, like I said, it was it was unbelievable. Like you described it sections. Just a mountain coming down and say like part of the avalanche and then you think it's over and then more and more and, and the whole mountain's coming down. The whole mountain's coming down. <laughs> and it's just wow. So that's my five, baby. And um I think it's a good five. I, I mean there's been so many, so many spectacular knockouts in this spectacular sport over the years. Yeah. Maybe we get another contest out of this. I don't know. That's up to you brainiacs, you and Rob. Um, yeah. You know, guess my five greatest knockouts, you know. Maybe we do something. And, and you, you know, you get, um, you get a, a signed glove or book from me or a shirt from the show. We'll figure it out. I mean, you yep. know, something where maybe you uh maybe you get a chance to to run against ken you know to to test your running skills against ken we'll figure out something maybe you get a chance to ride one of ken's 22 <laughs> ferraris right i mean now i cause problem for you <laughs> <laughs> well regarding the running race you know as a great champion would say uh i'm very easy to find Anyone who wants it can get it. I'm very easy. <laughs> Just send me a note. I'll tell you where I am. Anyone, there it is. When it comes to running, I'm ready. If you want to fight me, well, get in line. <laughs> Those days have passed me by. <laughs> well, listen, Teddy, That's a good. that sounds like a good place to end it here. I'm sure that will start the debate, and we'll probably have another 10 uh, other great knockouts that we might not have thought of. So I'm sure they'll let us know in the comments. But... Before we go, I just want to remind everyone, please check out BJJ Fanatics. Teddy's going to have some new uh, boxing um, tutorials up there. It's a great site. If you're a jiu-jitsu guy, there's, n there's no shortage of jiu-jitsu training tutorials up there. And soon to be the first boxing tutorial courtesy of the great Teddy Atlas. So, guys, thanks for the support. Appreciate you. Thanks, Teddy. Thanks, Teddy.